This is the mysterious chip bag. It's a seductive creature that contains a deadly toxin for those who suffer from high blood pressure. Often found in grocery store chip aisles, this creature typically runs in packs, luring in prey with discount prices and two-for-one deals. Less commonly known by its scientific name, multi-layer plastic, the chip bag's hide is usually misidentified as being made of aluminum, but the truth is far more complicated than that. Depending on where you live, there has been a lot of banning going on, particularly of single-use plastics, and for good reason. We produce almost 400 million tons of plastic each year, with about half of that only being used once before it's thrown away, hence single-use plastics. But here's the thing. While most people are typically focused on plastic bags, bottles, and to-go containers, I argue one of the worst single-use plastics is a bag that makes me a little salty. See, the problem with these sorts of bags is they are a bit deceptive. A chip bag has a shiny interior, which makes people think that it's made from some sort of metallic film. While that is true, that's only part of it. Chip bags, juice pouches, and other food containers all fall into the same category, multi-layer plastic. And that means that they contain at least one layer of plastic material. And with the issues of plastic waste and microplastics becoming ever more present, you could see why we may want to keep these things out of your local landfill. However, that's not that easy. Multi-layer plastic is the megazord of the packaging industry. It's built by combining the strengths of several different materials into one super material, keeping your food safe from the evils of food decay. But unlike the actual Megazord, it's not so easy to disassemble. Chip bags in particular are made of several different layers. Generally speaking, this is a sandwich of polypropylene with an inner layer of low density polyethylene. This filling is then surrounded by two different pieces of bread. The inner side is coated with a thin layer of aluminum and the outer side is coated with a product such as Surlin. As you can see, the majority of this bag is actually plastic, with the aluminum only being invited to give the bag some additional strength. So what's the problem? Sure, it's kind of a funky looking dry sandwich, but it's still edible. Well, the problem is we don't know how to deal with that. Multi-layer plastics like these chip bags make up about 100 million tons of plastic globally each year. That means that roughly a quarter of the plastic we make goes into stuff like this. And the main problem is almost none of it gets recycled. That's because multi-layer plastics are impossible to recycle using any form of mainstream recycling technique since those rely on mechanical recycling. If you've seen any of my previous videos on plastics, you already know where I'm going. But for the uninitiated, the traditional recycling process you are used to seeing is called mechanical recycling. In short, it takes your separated plastic waste, chops it up, and melts it together to form new plastic. And this works decently well on paper, but there are a lot of issues with this process that I talked about here, here, and probably here too. The reason why multi-layer plastic can't go through this process is what I emphasized earlier, separated plastic. Bringing back our sandwich and Megazord analogy, how exactly do you separate multi-layer plastic into its individual layers? Like I said, mechanical recycling requires the different types of plastic to be separated from each other, as well as the aluminum. The answer to that question is you don't, at least not with any process that is widely used on an industrial scale which means that multi-layer plastics are effectively non-recyclable. I mean, they even put that on the bag. So why haven't we banned these? A quarter of the plastic we make goes into making stuff like this, and yet we can't effectively recycle any of it. Yet plastic bags like this one, which actually are recyclable with our current industrial processes, are being banned. Does that make sense to anybody? Now, I haven't come across any evidence of the big corporate chip companies secretly paying off governments to avoid these bans. I actually don't think it's that complex. I personally think it's because we don't look at these the same way we look at that. In my opinion, the reason why these aren't being banned is because we don't think of these as being plastic, but they are in fact as single use as you can get. I'm not sure about you, but I don't reuse a Doritos bag for anything else once I've raised my blood pressure. But I do have a grocery bag drawer. They can be used again as a carrying bag for lunch, or as an impromptu shower cap, or a free pooper scooper for your furry children. They at least have some additional utility. Chip bags and other multi-layer plastics like them don't. At least not any that I'm aware of. If you do reuse them, let me know what for in the comments right below that like button. So what are the alternatives? If chip bags suck, then what else can our salty addiction be carried in? Well, that's hard to answer. There's a reason why we ended up with chip bags in the first place. 
Regular chip bags are great at what they do. They prevent gas transfer, which keeps chips from going stale. They are strong enough to be thrown around and packed, yet light enough to be shipped and stored easily. They are also perfect little billboards to entice you into making a purchase. And to be honest, nothing else comes close to checking all these boxes. Switching to, or really going back to metal cans makes them more expensive, heavier, harder to store, and more difficult to prevent staleness. Going paper-based could work, but those don't work well for particularly greasy potato chips. Honestly, the best alternative might still be plastic, just one that is actually recyclable, like this plastic Lay's can for instance. The problem here is that most potato chips aren't uniform because potatoes aren't uniform. The only way these stackable chips can even be packed this way is because they aren't made from cutting potatoes, but from using potato starch or dried potatoes. So either everyone switches to making chips like this, or you make your own chips at home instead. So maybe we don't have a great solution to changing how chips are packaged. What about trying to make what we currently have recyclable? Well, that is an option. Unlike mechanical recycling that physically breaks down plastic, chemical recycling breaks down plastic on a chemical level. Researchers like these ones out of the University of Wisconsin are developing methods to do just that. This specific paper refers to a method they call solvent targeted recovery and precipitation, or STRAP for short. On a high level, they are using different chemicals to dissolve and separate the different layers from each other. By carefully selecting which solvents are used and when, you can dissolve the different layers one at a time. Once you've separated those layers, you can recover the plastic through a precipitation process and then recycle it. Quite clever actually, and most research I've found on chemical recycling multi-layer plastic takes a similar approach. However, this is problematic. While I don't doubt that their methods work, they aren't going to be attracted to any large company for a few reasons. For one, using chemical solvents on a large scale is not desirable if it can be avoided. That's because solvents can be expensive, hazardous, and difficult to dispose of. While it is possible to also reuse the solvent, they eventually will degrade and can possibly contaminate the plastic you recover. That's not to discount the work that's being done here though. In fact, this is a pretty good research article that I would recommend reading for yourself. I just think there are a few more obstacles preventing this kind of approach from gaining widespread adoption in industry, especially when it's compared to the current approach of, it's not my problem. What would motivate a company that currently spends no money on fixing their disposal issue of their product to now spend money on it? Even if you said that you wanted to start a chemical recycling company using this type of approach, why would a company buy your recycled plastic? Unless your material is significantly cheaper than using new plastic, which is unlikely, there is no motivation for them to do this. And that's not even counting the fact that you need a robust, dedicated waste collection system for gathering multi-layer plastic, which currently does not exist in the US. So good luck with that. So doom and gloom is what you're saying, Lumi. No, not really. What I'm saying is to fix the problem, we have to make people like you more aware of it. Our plastic waste problem has been gaining momentum recently and has led to consumers pushing for companies and governments to do what they can to fix it. But unless people like you and I let them know that we're concerned about this stuff, then nothing will get done. My aim with this video is to show you that these multi-layer plastics are some of the worst single-use plastics out there. So as we go around banning plastics and pushing for alternatives, let's not forget about these two. While banning them outright is debatable, we need solutions for this problem, whether it's developing new materials or new methods for recycling. Multi-layer plastics are a multi-layer challenge we first need to recognize and then work to solve. Speaking of challenges though, some companies are tackling our plastic waste problem by just burning it instead. And you can find out more about that in this video right here. I'm Lumi, thanks for coming to the Benchtop and I'll see you over there. I don't know if y'all can hear all that going on. I don't know what's going on in my complex today, but there's a lot of yelling and running around that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> my head is too big. It doesn't fit. <laughs> like Michael Phelps. <laughs>